All right, everybody. Well, I want to welcome you back to Pastor's Perspective, our Friday uh, from 2 to 3 p.m. Central Standard Time Facebook live feed from Sugarland Bible Church. Uh, my name is Dr. Andy Woods, and I'm here with my good friend, colleague, fellow elder and associate pastor, uh, Dr. Jim McGowan. And we haven't done a these for a couple of weeks, have we? Feels like a brand new thing. Here. <laughs> brand new thing. And uh, the reason is because um, I've actually, for part of that time, the cathedral door in Wittenberg, Germany, and touched off the Protestant Reformation. And so it was a cruise uh, in retracing some of those sites and uh, kind of honoring him and his contribution to Christianity. I want to publicly thank uh, Compass Ministries, and in particular Bill and Susie Perkins, who run that ministry, for making it such a wonderful experience for myself and my wife. And uh, if you're thinking of a cruise to take, they go to the Holy Lands, they go to Europe, they go all kinds of places, uh, first-rate group first-rate stuff, I'd recommend you looking into Compass Ministries. But part of that cruise is we went to Wittenberg, Germany. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, I think so. And we actually saw the uh, door. Uh, now, it was burned down, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred years ago, and so they replaced it with a, a, a metal door, <laughs> which, uh, you know, kind of is a little strange because you can't really hammer a nail into a metal door but the door's been replaced but it was the same basic location and building where Martin Luther did that 500 years ago and so we got to go to the, the 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 church that was really the cradle of the Protestant Reformation and uh, we got to learn about Melanchthon and see where he lived and where Luther lived and uh, it, I have to tell you it's one thing learning about things uh, via photographs and the internet and scrapbooks and things like that. It's a totally different thing standing where these men stood and, you know, sort of uh, taking in the sacrifice that they made mm -hmm. to hand Christianity off to the next generation. Yes. And they basically stood for what we call the five solas. You know, sola is a Latin word, which means by itself. So we have sola scriptura. They stood on the authority of God's word alone against the ecclesiastical authorities telling them otherwise. Uh, sola scriptura, sola uh, fide, salvation by faith alone. Uh, sola gratia, by grace alone. Sola Christus, uh, through Christ alone. And let's see, did I name them all or am I missing one? Sola Deo Gloria, mm -hmm. to the glory of God alone. I think that comes to five. Uh, so, right. Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide, Sola Gratia, Sola Christos, um, and then Sola Deo Gloria. And these were people, Martin Luther in particular, was wanting to stand on the authority of the Word of God. And it's, um, you know, the, and they paid a great sacrifice and a price, you know, to do that. And to me, it's very, very sad to watch the evangelical church unaware that this Reformation ever happened. And through the emergent church, you know, to sort of drift back into these pre-Reformation dark age, dark ages practices that we see happening today. Lectio Divina. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people wanting to go back to monasticism, contemplative, contemplative prayer. prayer, when these were the things that, that Luther allowed us to escape from. Labyrinth. The labyrinth, uh, which is walking through a maze to get some kind of spiritual uh, liver quiver or whatever. And people are acting today with this emergent church movement as if the Protestant Reformation, you know, never happened. So anyway, I'm still a little bit on European time. That's why I've got these dark circles under my eyes. Mine but, are just because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad to be back. And, uh, you know, we had a, a two-week hiatus, so we're back with Pastor's Perspective. So that's what I've been doing. I feel kind of like a, a kid after summer giving a report to the class, <laughs> a book report or show and tell or whatever. Yeah. But it was just a neat experience. Um, you, know, you and I were speaking earlier about this, and I'm kind of coming back to your comment about 
how we over here in the West have started to move away from the authority of Scripture. And it, it's just interesting. You were you were telling me how as you would you talked with the man on the street, uh, you realized that many of the people there didn't even have a clue as to to what the whole Wittenberg Wittenberg Church was all about. Yeah, you, you, you talk to the man on the street, and I'll, t- I'll tell you something that was just really striking. There was this giant statue of Martin Luther in one of the cities we visited. And off to the side, there was a guy playing a guitar for tips. Mm. And people would come in and give money. And, and his song that he was playing as we were you know, standing in the presence of this statue of Martin Luther was uh, that song by John John Lennon about imagine? I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> and he and I I said, man, I wish this fellow, you know, I'd actually tip him more. I didn't tip him at all, but I would tip him, and I would tip him a lot if he would play "Mighty Fortress Is Our God" yeah. instead of yeah. "We Are the World," yeah. in the presence of this Martin Luther statue. And in Wittenberg, there's this big green movement taking place, and they're all getting ready to come together and commemorate the earth. And uh, it's almost as it's almost as if the people in that town don't know what happened there, and what God did there. And even some of the secular tour guides I've, right. I learned will take people through that area and won't mention Martin Luther a single time. Mind-boggling. It is mind-boggling, and it's it shows you that according to Romans one, we have the power to suppress truth yes. in creation and even in history. But fortunately, the tour guide for our group was obviously an evangelical Christian, and and uh, she, uh, this particular tour guide, uh, she in this case, you know, showed us all the main sites and mm-hmm. brought these things to our attention. Um, well, that's, so, that's what can happen though here. You know, if we're not careful, you know, we're going down the same path. That's one of the things that struck struck me as I was in Europe is the trends that are taking place in Europe concerning a rejection of borders, because mm-hmm. Europe is now a region, mm-hmm. uh, and having one currency governing a, a region called the euro. Yeah. So the trends related to regionalism, the trends related to a borderless society. Mm-hmm. The trends related to uh, socialism, liberalism, you know, I see those same trends here in the United States. It's just we're not quite as far along as Europe is. But and the, the trend of erasing the vestige of our American Judeo-Christian history, yeah. most people don't know this, but America was started on Christian principles. And today in America, we act as if those Christian principles never existed. Most. I'm, I'm old enough, Pastor, to remember as in being in elementary school, being taught that this country was founded on Christian, Christian principles. Mm-hmm. And, and to, to, to be alive long enough to be at a place in our country where we're rewriting history mm-hmm. and we're not even talking about some of these things. Mm-hmm. It's, just, it's, it's just frightening. Yeah, and talk to your average millennial today and ask them how much they know right. about America's Judeo-Christian heritage. Yeah. Now, they know a lot about global warming. Yeah. Or mm-hmm. climate change, right. or universal health care, mm-hmm. or saving the, animals. saving the animals, or the need to ban guns, but they don't right. know anything uh, about America's Judeo-Christian yeah. heritage. That's well, that's what's happening in Europe, and we're not really that far behind. In fact, my own mother you know, tells me that when she grew up in the public schools, her school teacher used to read to her in front of the whole class, start every day of the school year reading from the book of Psalms. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, today that something like that would be unheard of, but that's how fast you can lose your culture. And we're into this incredible apostasy today. Uh, Europe has gone through it. And we in the United States, if we don't uh, wake up fast, are gonna be pulled right into that vortex. Well, anyway, uh, I just wanted to say a couple words about my trip, but really what we've been talking about in the past episodes of Pastor's Perspective is a questionnaire for SLBC missionaries. This is a questionnaire that you can apply, ask of your missionaries to see if they're on track. You can ask these of your uh, Sunday school teachers. Um, You can ask these of your pastors and spiritual leaders. And it's just a spiritual inventory to determine is your church theologically sound. Now we have 
posted these questions because many people yes. have asked us how they can get a copy of these questions. Right. I believe it's on our Facebook page. Actually, w it's on our it's on our main church page, page www.slbc.org. If they'll go to the missions button and click on that, at the bottom of that page, there's a button that you can click on that will pull this questionnaire up for you. Mm -hmm. Great. So our questions are your questions now. That's right. And, you know, you may even want to take our list of, what do we have, 43 questions, and, and add to it yeah. or adjust them according to your particular needs. But at least you have a framework for trying to figure out our our churches, uh, is your church or any of our churches theologically sound? Yeah, we really encourage people to do this, too, because this is too important. You know, we have people out there, I don't want to get sidetracked here, but, you know, we're supporting people who are representing us out on the mission field, and it's incumbent upon us to know what they believe and what they're teaching. Sure. So that's why we did this. And if you're supporting a local church through your membership, through your attendance, and through your financial regular giving, uh, I would I would say this. It's not just your privilege to ask what does your church believe. It's your duty. Absolutely right. And if your spiritual leaders won't answer your answer questions, uh, to me they're trying to hide something. Yeah, something's wrong. And maybe it's time to to pray about a new place to fellowship. Yeah. Amen. So, you know, we haven't gotten very far in this questionnaire. We've only done three questions. But just to kind of recap where we've been, can you read the first question to us? Yes, I'd be happy to. Question number one says, explain your views on the authority, inerrancy, inspiration, and perspicuity, which is the word clarity, of the Scripture. And we went into detail on that. We did. And really what that question is pertaining to is, do your spiritual leaders honor the authority of the Word of God? Yes. Or not. Now, now, past episodes that we've done, you can find on the SLBC Facebook page. Right. And you could also go to my personal YouTube channel, uh, Andy Woods. Type in Andy Woods uh, into, the, into your YouTube search engine, and my uh, channel, YouTube channel, should pop up. But we have each of these past episodes, Is Your Church Theologically Sound? I think we've done two or three of these, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. Uh, posted there for you as well because a lot of people write to us and they say I want to send this to my friends and family but I'm not a Facebook user yes. so you can find this archived on our Facebook page or on YouTube uh, so question number two what was that about you want to read two do you believe in a literal or normal interpretation of the entire Bible and explain so question one is do you believe in the authority of the scripture and question two is do you follow a method of interpretation literal interpretation which holds to a high view of the authority of scripture yes. so a lot of people say they, they believe that the scripture is inspired but they don't interpret it literally well the, the authority just got transferred didn't it from the text to the mind of the interpreter so question two is designed to ferret out monkey business in that area and I think the last time we were together, we spent the whole time on question three. What, what does that say? Yeah, and, and this is a great transition, too. We start with the authority of Scripture. We start with how you interpret Scripture. And if you answer the first two questions appropriately, then you're going you're gonna to answer the third one properly. Yes. Here's, here's question number three. State your views on early Genesis, such as the age of the earth, the length of the creation days, the beginning of death, the extent of Noah's flood, etc., so this is really getting at, do you believe that Genesis 1 through 11 was a historical events that happened, and do you interpret these things literally? Is it authoritative? Is it authoritative? Because if you don't believe in Genesis 1 through 11, that there was a literal Adam who sinned in a literal garden and ate from a literal forbidden tree, and introduced a life of sin terminated by death. If you don't believe that, then you really have no business preaching the gospel. You don't even know what the gospel is. Right. The gospel is a cure mm -hmm. to what happened in Genesis 1 through 11. Yeah. Yeah. But you take away Genesis 1 through 11, creation, fall, flood, Tower of Babel, those sorts of issues, then why preach the gospel at all? You don't need it. You don't need it because, you know, a lot of people look at our world and they think it's normal. Yeah. 
Matter of fact, even in church, sometimes you hear kids singing the song, This is My Father's World. And I always bristle a little bit when I yeah. hear that because I get what they're saying. This is our Father's world in the sense that He created everything. But this world that we're living in is not according to the Father's design. It was marred terribly yes. by what happened in Genesis 3. And, you know, just compare your high school yearbook picture to your modern day driver's license picture, and you'll see your body is deteriorating. From dust you were taken, from dust you shall return. Genesis 3, verse 19. The gospel is an answer to that problem. Uh, sin didn't just separate us from God, but it brought in physical consequences. It brought us under the judgment of God. And um, therefore, the gospel makes sense if you take Genesis 1 through 11 at face value. That's right. Now, of course, when I say at face value, we believe in figures of speech when they're obvious in the text. Right. But if there's no obvious figure of speech, we take things literally. If the plain sense, as Josh McDowell says, makes good sense, then seek no other sense, lest you wind up with nonsense. And we want to follow a method of interpretation that keeps the authority in the biblical text. Amen. Shocking how many church leaders don't want to do that today. Yes, it is. Very much so. Well, this takes us to the question, some questions now dealing with salvation that we haven't uh, asked and answered yet. But why don't we try there with number four. And let's see how far we get with number four. All right. Uh, question number four is, if Jesus Christ was at the gate of heaven and he asked you, why should I, that is Jesus Christ, let you into my heaven, what would you say to him? Now, when I was confronted with the gospel by a man of God about the age of 16, this is the question he asked me. You're, you're, you died, you're standing at heaven's gates, if, if there are heaven's gates, um, and you're asked, why should you be admitted? At that time, my answer was, well, I am a good person. So the focus was placed back on myself. Right. When reality, uh, that was this man's tip that I was unsaved because I was trusting in myself, mm -hmm. but I wasn't trusting in what Jesus did for me. Amen. And, you know, Christianity, the Bible, quite frankly, is not a book about what we do for God. That was the, that's the great mistake of the religionist. Right. The Bible is what God has done for man. Yes. It's not us reaching up to God, trying to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, it's him reaching down to us in yes. the person of Jesus Christ, and we receive what Jesus did for us as a free gift. Mm -hmm. Now, do you want to know where someone stands on that? A church leader or even a person in your family uh, that you kind of maybe have doubts about their salvation, a co-worker, you want to figure out where they stand spiritually? How they answer that question will tell you. So really, um, look, if we could just look at a couple verses, can you look at Genesis 3 and verse 7? You know, right. people act like there are so many options on the table, but there's really only two. Either man is trying to justify himself before God, or God is justifying man by what God has done. Genesis 3, verse 7 is right after the fall of man, and I believe it's the first act of religion yes. recorded in the Bible. Religion, by definition, is man trying to improve himself mm -hmm. uh, to cover up his sin, and we're all sinners. Romans 3.23 is very clear about this. To cover up his sin through his own power, that's religion. I spent the first 16 years of my life as a religious person, yeah. and I think we're religious by nature. Mm -hmm because we want to take some credit. If I can do a work, I can take some kind of credit, can I, for saving myself. Could we say we're religious by sin nature? By sin nature, thank you, thank you. So notice what Adam and Eve did immediately after the fall when God called them to an accounting, Genesis right. 3, 7. Now, as, as I get ready to read this, there are people who uh, regularly ask us what version of the Bible we use, and generally we're using the New American Standard Version this happens to be the 1995 update. So for those of you that are concerned or interested in that's the version that we're using. 
So Genesis chapter 3, verse 7 says this. Then the eyes of both of them, this is Adam and Eve, the mm -hmm. eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So they recognize that they had sinned, and they're trying to fix themselves through human power. In this case, loin coverings. That's religion. I would say most of planet Earth today is right there in verse 7. Right. They're following some kind of creed or formula or ritual. It's always something they do. Yeah. And that's what they're trusting their eternity in. Yes. And God corrects the situation rapidly and explains to them that's not how you're going to be saved. Yeah. And the, the proper way of salvation is right there in verse 21. It's interesting to me that right at the beginning of human history, these two paths are outline for us genesis 3 7 being the wrong path genesis 3 21 being the right path do you do you have genesis 3 yes. 21 mm -hmm. in verse 21 it says the lord god made garments of skin for adam and his wife and clothed them see verse 7 is all about what adam and eve are trying to do that's right verse 21 it's what the lord did yeah. uh, the lord god made mm -hmm. the lord god clothed them Right. Now, where do you think these garments of skin that God used to clothe a guilty Adam and Eve, where do you think those came from? Well, there's only one answer to that. <laughs> they came from an animal What did they had to be slain. And what did the animal do wrong? Well, the animal didn't do anything didn't wrong. Didn't do anything wrong. So God, right at the beginning of history, is saying, here's how the sin problem is going to be corrected. I will kill an innocent substitute in your place. And through that provision of animal skins from that killed innocent substitute, I will clothe you. You will not clothe yourself. I will clothe you mm -hmm. through a uh, death of, a, of an innocent substitute. Right. Now, if that doesn't scream out the gospel of Jesus Christ, I don't know what does. Mm -hmm. So right there in seed form, we have a presentation of religion, verse 7. And the gospel, verse 21. So question number four, when it asks you um, if Jesus was at the gate of heaven and he asks you, why should I, Jesus Christ, let you into heaven, what would you say? How the person answers will tell you if they're in verse 7, a religionist and therefore unsaved, or if they're trusting in what Jesus has done. So I'm not really relying upon my good works to get to heaven. I'm relying upon the good work of Christ yes. and the benefits that have been transferred to me Amen. because I've received it as a free gift. Yes. So do your missionaries understand that? Or are they out there peddling a works-oriented doctrine? Does your pastor understand that? Or is he peddling a works-oriented doctrine? Uh, does your Sunday school teacher understand that? Or are they peddling a works-oriented doctrine? You know, I think it's uh, Second John... It, it talks about to not let them, the false teachers, into your house. Mm -hmm. You know, where did the early church meet? They met in houses. And what he's saying is don't let people with a corrupt doctrine into your house, in other words, into your church, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. into your pulpit to teach your children in Sunday school yeah. uh, unless they understand something as basic as this. Amen. And so, you know, we need to be screening people a little bit more carefully, don't we? I think so. And not just let anybody uh, teach us because we're under the banner of tolerance. Well, you know, nowadays, just about anyone can get up behind a pulpit. Yeah. It doesn't make any difference what their, histor their, their past history is. It doesn't make any difference, you know, whether they agree with you doctrinally or theologically. Uh, we'll just let anybody up, inside, up in behind our pulpit. Yeah, I call it the three G's of ministry. <clears throat> you got to have, number one, uh, good looks. Number two, the gift of gab. And number three, a guitar. Mm. Not that I'm against guitars or good looks or the gift of gab, but basically that's all people look at. And as long as they sound good saying it, it doesn't matter if they teach the right stuff or not. And we're called to a higher standard than that. Amen. And that's why this questionnaire is so important. Amen. Well, we're, we're actually progressing here. The last time we were together, we only covered one question. So now we've covered one, and let's, let's see if we can cover another one. Do you have question number five handy? Yes, sir. <clears throat> question number five. 
if you were going to present the gospel to a lost sinner, tell us how you would do it. Please use your exact words and try to be complete in your presentation of it. Include everything you think is necessary to be saved. That's a, that, there's a lot there, Pastor. Yeah. How, how would you present the gospel? Uh, let's look at a few verses. Can you look up Acts 16? Mm, no, I can't. <laughs> verses 30 and 31. One of my favorite passages. And as you're turning there, I'll read the famous uh, John 3.16 passage, which, right. <clears throat> which we all probably know by heart, but I'll just read it so I don't uh, leave anything out. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, as we read John 3.16, how many conditions are, are there for the lost sinner to come into a right relationship with God? Well, there's only one there. Only one condition. The rest of the verse is education right. about what Jesus has done. But the one condition held out to the lost sinner is to believe. Mm -hmm. Now, believe, when you look it up in a dictionary like Vine's Dictionary, you know, the noun is pistis, the verb is pistuo. It basically means to depend upon mm -hmm. or to rely upon or to have confidence in. Mm -hmm. And it's really a condition of the heart where you're, you're resting for your eternity and the safekeeping of your soul, no longer in yourself, but in what Jesus has done. Yes. And that is the single, and you're resting in Christ and Christ alone. That's right. It's back to the Reformation, yeah, you know, sola scriptura. And so, uh, you know, in right. essence, there is but a single condition, you know, which is necessary uh, for the lost sinner to have a relationship with God. Back to the Reformation, that's something we would call also not just sola Christus, but sola fide, mm -hmm. you know, or faith by itself. Uh, go ahead. I was just going to ask you a question because a minute ago you used the expression receive Christ, and now you're saying believe in Christ, and I'm just... Uh, is that a separate condition, receiving a separate condition? Yeah, if you go over to, um, I'll read it since I'm in John, John 1 and verse 12. And by the way, did you know John's gospel is the only gospel that's written to the unsaved? Yes. Uh, most of the books of the Bible are written to saved people. Mm -hmm. but most people don't know that. Most people don't know that. But over in John 20, I'll get back to John 1 in just a minute. John 20, verses 30 and 31 is what many would say is the purpose statement of John's gospel. It says, Therefore many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Verse 31 is the key, but these have been written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So the purpose statement itself alerts you to the fact that the people he's writing to, uh, first of all, hadn't believed in Christ mm -hmm. because he's writing so that they might believe. Yes. And because they've never believed in Christ, they've never experienced life in his name. So he's writing to them so that they might experience life in his name. And, you know, the Gospel of John has several signs of Jesus in it. Seven are yes. mentioned directly, not, not even including his resurrection. Mm -hmm. And John, beginning with the, the, the miracle of the wedding, uh, the, the, the wine, wine mm -hmm. yeah, the water to wine at Cana. There we go. And there's several signs documented. Why are those given? Just to give us a magic show? Mm -hmm. No, to convince the unsaved reader that Jesus is who he claimed to be, yeah. the Son of God. Why? Just to give us a theology lesson? No, so that the unsaved person, once they come to an awareness of who Jesus is, might fulfill a single condition, mm -hmm. which is to believe, rely upon, depend upon, have confidence in Jesus for the safekeeping of their soul and their eternity. And once they do that, they're regenerated. Yes. The Holy Spirit comes into them, and they immediately experience life in His name. As an honest desire to enter John's gospel Amen, because John's gospel has an evangelistic purpose. Yes. Now, I'm not saying people can't get saved by reading other parts of the Bible, 
But the reality of the situation is those other parts of the Bible, generally speaking, are written to people that are already saved. John's gospel is written to the unsaved. So it's an evangelistic gospel. So our major clues on how to evangelize, I believe, should primarily come from the, the gospel of John. But back to your question about receive, uh, if you look at John 1, 12, it says, But as many as received him, that's the word you brought up, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who what? Believe in his name. Now this word believe occurs 99 times in John's gospel. So sometimes synonyms are used, yes. different words, same meaning. So you'll notice how receive is used here as a synonym for believe, but, but receive is really not the operative word. Right. It's not the word receive that's used 99 times, it's the word believe. And occasionally he'll throw an, another word in as a synonym. But when you're dealing with lost people, you really have to emphasize this word believe. Now if you want to use the word receive, explain to them. Mm -hmm that receive is a synonym for believe and explain to them what believe means. Right. You were going to say something? No, I just I appreciate that so much because, uh, you know, it, it is really a synonym. Received is a synonym for believe here. And I wanted to bring that up just because I think sometimes people get hung up on this. Yeah, absolutely. They, they want to add all kinds of qualifying statements to the one condition right. for salvation. So right. I wanted to, to have an opportunity to address yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, good stuff. And... It's not just here in John. John gives us a major clue. But as the early church went out to evangelize, we have a record in the book of Acts related to how they shared the gospel. That's right. And over in Acts 16, verses 30 and 31, is the Philippian jailer mm -hmm. who asked life's most important question. There isn't a more important question in life to ask than this one. Mm -hmm. And why don't you read that to us? Well, a little bit of context, if I may. Paul and Silas have been in prison, they're in jail, and around midnight they're singing praises and hymns to God, and the jailer is listening to them, and then the Lord sends an earthquake which busts open all the doors of the jails. Well, can you imagine that happened down here at the county jail? That would be a mess, <laughs> right? And the jailer is concerned for his life because he knows he's responsible for every one of those individuals and, and with his own life. And so he is thinking about yeah. doing himself in, yeah. And Paul and Silas say, don't do that. You yeah. know, we're all here. Because under Roman law, if if, J, if uh, inmates escaped under your watch, yes. it, was your, it was your hide. Yeah, life for life. Life for that's, life. That's right. So in that situation, so this is a, this is a pretty serious situation yep. going on here, right? And so the, he comes running to them, and, and I just love what it says here in verse 31, Acts 16, 31. Well, let me back to verse 30. It says, and he brought, he said, that the Philippian jailer said to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Pretty clear. That's a great question. Shall I read the next verse? Please, please, right. please. Here, this isn't what they said. They didn't say, um, well, commit to doing a bunch of good works. Mm -hmm. Right? They didn't, he didn't say that. Right. He said, clean up your life so you can come to Jesus. He didn't say that either. Here's what he said. He didn't say turn from your sins. He didn't say turn from your sin. He didn't say feel really bad about your sin. Be really sorry, right? No, he didn't. He didn't say show up to church next Sunday. He didn't say that. He didn't say give any money, did he? He didn't say walk an aisle. Yeah, that's right. He didn't say bow your heads and pray this prayer. Now, folks, don't get mad Here at me. Go. Read the Bible. Okay. What, what did he say? We're going to get kicked off the air. <laughs> this is what he said. They said, Paul and Silas said to him, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. So he, they offered him one condition. They sure did. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. That's right. You and your household. Now, that household part, I would take it as the Philippian jailer would get saved and because of his leadership role in the family, he would evangelize his family yes, members. Absolutely. I've sort of discovered this true that when the man gets saved, the family comes along easier. That's right. When the wife gets saved, it's more difficult for the husband and the rest of the family to come along. And I think that has to do with the leadership role God has given to the man in the family unit. And where did he establish that? 
goes right back to Genesis, doesn't Didn't it? Did we say something about the importance of Genesis? Mm -hmm. Amen, brother. So it all fits together. All right there. And that's why there's so many instructions about uh, a woman who's saved, how she and her husband remains unsaved, right. how she's to interact with her unsaved husband. I can think of two areas of Scripture, uh, 1 Peter 3 and 1 Corinthians 7, if I'm not mistaken, that deal with that subject. There's no real instructions uh, that I can think of related to the opposite being the case. Right. Um, what if the uh, husband is saved and the wife remains unsaved? Because generally the way it works, if the man gets saved and he's a leader, the woman will get saved pr pretty quick after that. So I think yeah. that's what he means when he says you and your household. Too. Mm -hmm. But having said that, we like to point out the fact that what does the verse say and what does it not say? It emphasizes believe, that's right. which is the one condition for salvation and all this other stuff about feeling bad, shedding tears, turning from personal sins. Now, are we against people turning from personal sins? No, we're not against that at all. But that doesn't save anybody. Nope. The gospel is not what we do for Christ. It's mm -hmm. what Christ has done for us. Do you, you think an unsaved person who doesn't have the Holy Spirit inside of them has the power to turn from personal sins? Well, the Bible makes it clear they don't. They don't. So turning from personal sins is part of your maturity in Christ, yes. your growth in Christ. Yes. But turning from personal sins doesn't justify you before a holy God. The one thing that God asks us to do is to believe or to trust in what God has done for us Amen. through Jesus Christ, God the Son, the second member of the Trinity, who died on a cross 2,000 years ago to pay the full penalty for our sins right. and who rose bodily from the dead on the third day, thereby vindicating exactly who he claimed to be. And by the way, John 3.16 says this. John's gospel says this about 99 times. Acts 16 verses 30 and 31 says this. And when you actually start to study this, what you'll discover is the single condition believe is held out to the lost sinner probably about 160 to 200 times. Mm -hmm. So it is uh, an amazing thing that we've chosen many times to reject the 200 clear verses right. and to go to some obscure verse somewhere yes. and make it sound as if that's what someone has to do to be saved. Right. I mean, to me, God could not be clear on this subject. I agree. And that's really what, what you have to focus on with the unsaved. Now, if you go over to Romans 4. Well, before you do that, please, can, I, can please. I read verse 32? Absolutely. Because I think verse 32 substantiates what you were saying. Yep. Because in verse 31, they said, believe on the Lord, you and your household. But then in verse 32, he sa it says, and they did something. They didn't just say believe. They gave them some content to believe. Uh -huh. They said, they spoke the word of the Lord to him. Now notice this, together with all who were in his house. So they all heard the word of the Lord, and they all believed. That's right. See, amen. Well, you, you keep reading, <laughs> and you go down to verse 33. Uh, why don't you read that? And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. Now this is the Philippian jailer. Mm -hmm. And immediately he was baptized and all his household. So that's talking about water baptism. It is talking about that. Uh, full immersion. Mm -hmm. So water baptism doesn't save them. No. They were already saved in verse uh, 30, 30 and 31 when they mm -hmm. believed. Yep. So if water baptism didn't save them, what's the purpose of being water baptized? Well, water baptism, all it is, it has no saving power. It's just an outward confession of an inward reality. Yes. You know, I, I think if this man had died before being water baptized, we'd see him in heaven, wouldn't we? I think we have an example of someone like that. Yeah, we? and who would that a be? Thief on the cross. Thief on the cross. Uh, Jesus didn't say, now, listen, today you'll be with me in paradise, but first of all, they're going to have to bring you down off the cross and baptize you, right. and then you'll make it. Right. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Yeah. He doesn't say as Jesus was hanging there to his side, quick throw water on yeah. this guy before he dies, you know, so we can get him into heaven. Right. 
Now, when we talk like this, we're not undervaluing water baptism. We not think it's a for important step. We we have the privilege of baptizing many people at this church, but yeah. we have them take a class first. That's right. And we help them to recognize that water baptism doesn't save anybody. That's right. The only thing that saves you is you placing your personal faith for your eternity and the safekeeping of your soul in what Jesus has done. Amen. Period. End of story. Now, part of your growth is to follow through with the ordinance of baptism, right. which is just an outward symbol of an inward reality. It's a testimony to the world yes. through the ritual or ordinance of baptism, which the Lord himself commanded the church to follow, that you now belong to Jesus Christ. Yes. But should you die or have a heart attack or get in a car wreck, before you have a chance to be baptized uh, after believing in Christ, then you will go to heaven. Of course, yes. So we see a, a specific order here in Acts 16, 30, and 31. Yes, it's amazing uh, how many of our evangelistic models would be corrected if we would just take the time to go back to sola scriptura, Amen. which is what the reformers did, and try to get our cues from the Bible and the Bible alone. Have you noticed how as we talk about these things, we keep finding ourselves going back to the issues we addressed in the first questions we talked about? We talk about we're constantly going back to the authority of the Scriptures. Mm -hmm. We're constantly going back to how do you view Genesis. Mm -hmm. it's all, it all comes together. Mm -hmm. It's important. See, I, I don't really care what theologian A or theologian B says. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't care what N.T. Wright says. Everybody today is worried about what N.T. Wright says. I could care less about what N.T. Wright says. I care about what the Bible says. Yes. Theologians and teachers have value to me if they can help me understand this book. Right. But the authority in any church ought to be this book. It's good preaching. It's good preaching, and that's why we set up the questions the way we did. Can you go over to Romans 4? four and five i just want to show folks why god set up the plan of salvation in such a simple simple way and by the way this plan of salvation is as old as abraham this is how abraham was justified before god uh, on the singular condition of believe uh, can you read romans it's speaking of abraham romans four four and five yes sir romans chapter four verses four and five now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. See, Isaiah 64 and verse 6 says, Our works of righteousness, now this is interesting, works of righteousness, what would those be? Those would be things we're trusting in to justify ourselves before a holy God. It's what Adam and Eve were doing back in Genesis 3, verse 7. It says very specifically in Isaiah 64, verse 6, our works of righteousness are as filthy rags. Right. God is not going to justify anybody on the basis of religion or ritual or human energy or human effort. Amen. And... Uh, he gives an example here. He says to uh, the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but what is due. So at the workplace, when you log in hours and you get your paycheck, you don't say thanks for the gift because right. you earn that paycheck. Right. So, And then he goes on in verse 5 of Romans 4, and he says, but to the one who does not work but believes... Let's let's say that again. But to the one who does not work, but believes, believes in what? Be the faith is only as good as the object it's placed in. Right. Believes in him, yes. the crucified and ris uh, risen uh, Savior, Jesus Christ. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness god won't justify people on the basis of works and so according to verse 5 what is the one thing a lost sinner can do which in the mind of god is not a work believe in him it is to believe in him but to the one who does not work but believes in him so that's why god is so clear on this point because anything else we're doing trusting in our own goodness our ability to pray a prayer, 
Now, am I against people praying a prayer to get saved? Not against that at all, as long as they understand it's not the prayer that saves them. Right. right. It's the faith expressed in the prayer that saves them. Right. Uh, and we're very confused on this today. We're, yes, we're, we're, we're giving people a bunch of things to do, and I'm not sure they understand really what they're doing. Mm -hmm. The only thing God is going to accept is the personal faith of the lost sinner into his provision to the one who does not work but believes. And that's why it says this somewhere between 160 to 200 times. Right. Uh, right. This is the one condition the lost sinner must satisfy in order to enter into a relationship with the God that made them. So um, what are some wrong gospel presentations? I have a few. Ask Jesus into your heart. You don't find that expression anywhere relative to a lost sinner. Give your life to Christ. Uh, I have people all the time saying, I gave my life to Christ when I was in such and such an age. Well, the gospel isn't what you give to God. Right. It's what God mm -hmm. gives to you. Right. And you receive it as a gift, as the one thing you can do which is not a work, which is to believe. Make a commitment to Christ. Turn over the controls of your life to Christ. Yeah. Believe and be baptized to be justified. Right. Now, am, am I against being committed to Christ, being baptized, turning the controls of your life over to Christ? I'm not against those things, but those are conditions for your growth right. Right. and your maturity once you get saved. Once you become a believer. These are not conditions to be justified before God. And if someone preaches to you the opposite of what I'm saying, Paul says that is an anathema. That is a false gospel. This is how you can always recognize a true gospel from a false gospel. Where does it put the spotlight? Where does it put the focus? Is the focus on me and what I do? That's a false gospel. A true gospel places the focus on Christ and what, it, what, what he has done, and us receiving what he has done as a gift. Right. Believe and keep the Ten Commandments. Another false gospel. Submit to Christ's mastery or lordship over your life. Mm -hmm. Can you look up uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15? Sure. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Uh, we have quite a debate going on in the body of Christ, don't we, on the doctrine of lordship salvation. Yes, we do. And what people basically say is to be justified before God, believing in Christ is not enough. Mm -hmm. You have to submit every area of your life to the lordship of Christ. Mm -hmm. First Peter 3, verse 15 has an interesting thing to say about that. It does. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Question, is that verse addressing believers or unbelievers? Well, it sounds to me, as I read it here, that it's addressing believers. Why? Because it says the hope... Mm -hmm. That is in you. And you're making a defense. If you weren't a believer, you wouldn't be making a defense. You wouldn't be defending anything. But notice what it says. Sanctify mm -hmm. Christ as Lord in your hearts. Mm -hmm. This business of surrendering every area of your life to the Lordship of Christ is part of your sanctification. See the word sanctify there? Which in essence means, at least in this context, your development in Christ. Yeah your growth in Christ, mm -hmm. your maturity in Christ. That's where your lordship salvation comes from. See, I don't believe in lordship justification. Right. If I were to teach lordship justification, I'd be teaching a works-oriented gospel because that's all about what I do for Christ. Right. I teach rather lordship sanctification mm -hmm. as you come under the influence of the Holy Spirit and start to learn about your resources yes. in Christ. Yes then what the Holy Spirit does is say, I want you to walk with me under the power and the resources that I've given you. That's where your lordship sanctification comes from or salvation 
as related to your growth in Christ, not how you come to Christ. Right. And I think a lot of people out there think that they're saved because of something they did, surrender control of their life to Christ. You know, if Jesus had an opportunity to preach Lordship Salvation, you know who he would have preached it to? The woman at the well. Mm -hmm. John 4. Yeah. You don't get a more messed up person than her. Exactly. How many husbands did she have? I think it was seven. Seven or five or the one you're with, you're not even yeah, married to. Yeah, married to the one you're with. Uh, I mean, this was a, this was a, a woman who was morally uh, bankrupt. And when Jesus interacts with her, he never says, uh, what you need to do is you need to get yourself morally fixed. Yeah. He doesn't say, clean yourself up and come to me. Yeah, that's right. He uh, what, what he talks about is the water, the living water, which according to John's gospel is accessible by faith alone. Amen. He says, you know, the, this well that you're drinking from, you know, you'll thirst again, but the water I give, you'll never thirst again. And he's talking about a provision greater than herself that comes into her at the point of faith. Amen. If Jesus w was teaching uh, some kind of works-oriented doctrine, he could have easily told this woman to get yourself straightened out morally and sexually and uh, everything else, but he doesn't say a word about yeah, it. He doesn't. So we do not teach, we don't, we don't believe the Bible teaches that we... Uh, somehow fix ourselves to get right with God. That's a false gospel. You believe in Christ. You're immediately forgiven. The Holy Spirit comes into you. You have the new nature. And now once you have these things, the Holy Spirit says, okay, now let's talk about your growth. Yeah, that's right. These are conditions for your growth in Christ, not how you came to Christ. Amen. Uh, I'm kind of belaboring this a little bit because I think we need to be clear on it. Well, we do. And, and I... I was going to address this with you also. Please. You, you know, I think there are a lot of people out there who would say to us or would want to say to us, well, these are just semantics that we're talking about. You know, how you present the gospel, just semantics. And, um, you know, the issue I have with this, semantics matter. Words matter. You know, the way you present the gospel matters because, you know, there are people out there who are going to hear what you say if you're not articulating it correctly, then they're going to come away with a skewed idea of how you become a believer. And they perhaps may even think they're a believer, and they're really not. Mm -hmm. I've encountered that situation mm -hmm. before. I've had people that I've witnessed to before who had believed for a number of years that they had trusted Christ. But when you sit down and you share the gospel with them accurately, they recognize, well, no, I really didn't. Having just returned from Wittenberg, Germany, and stood in the very place where Martin Luther stood, I can, I can confidently tell you this, that had it not been for semantics, the Protestant Reformation would not have happened. That's right. They insisted on a word called sola. Yes. That's why we went through the five solas a little earlier, which means by itself. Had they just semantically dropped that word, mm -hmm. They could have gotten along with the Roman Catholic hierarchy. Right. But because of the word sola, it launched the Protestant Reformation. All of that to say words matter. Words matter. Semantics matters. They do. And people kind of get on our case sometimes for wrangling about words, but that's what Paul's doing here. That's, that's right. That's what Christ is doing, and that's what the Protestant Reformers uh, uh, did. By, by uh, the way, let me make sure I please, correct Please, myself, please, please. I said seven husbands. It was five husbands, as you correctly noted. And then he said that the one you currently have isn't your husband. Right, right. Uh, other false gospels, repent or confess your sins. Praying the sinner's prayer. Coming forward. Uh, altar calls are pretty big in churches. Um, am I against altar calls? Not per se as long as it's explained to people that walking an aisle didn't save you. Right. It's believing that saved you. If you're telling people you've got to walk an aisle to be saved, what do you do with the person in the wheelchair? What do you do with the person that's bedridden and can only catch the service on TV or online? What do you do with someone living in an Islamic country that hears the gospel, perhaps through social media or some other source, literature, 
but they know that if they publicly say anything about Christ, then their wife or daughter could be raped. Mm -hmm. Are we going to say that that person is not saved? Um, See, the things that work in America don't really work too well in Islamic countries or communist countries. And so we need to keep the Bible, the Bible, and tell people exactly what God is requiring of the lost sinner, which is to believe. So what we recommend here is a, a, a technique. I believe Larry Moyer is the first one that brought this to my attention, but we call it the five finger, for lack of a better word, method. Um, you know, when you talk to a lost sinner, you try to introduce five things. Number one, that they are a sinner. Romans 3.23 is very good on that. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Then you tell them, number two, moving to the index finger, that don't do, if you don't want to do the time, don't do the crime. So, in other words, sin brings a penalty. That penalty is death. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Then you move to the middle finger and you explain to them what Jesus did for them. Romans 5.8 is very good on this. God demonstrating his love for us uh, in this Christ died for us. Uh, Of course, when I kind of rattle off these verses off the top of my head, I'm I'm worried I'm going to mangle the verse. But Romans 5.8 says God demonstrates his love, his own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then you move to the ring finger, and this is where you see everything I've said thus far is education. I'm not told the lost sinner to do anything. Mm -hmm. This is where you tell them that believe and define it for them, depending upon, relying upon what Jesus has done for them is the one condition God asks them to do. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is good on that. Mm -hmm. John 3, 16 is good on that. And then the last thing you do, moving to the uh, pinky or small finger, is you tell them, you don't just leave them, but you tell them that if they've trusted in Christ, that the gift of eternal life is eternally theirs. Mm -hmm. They can know that they have eternal life. 1 John 5, verse uh, 13 is good on that. Do you want to read that real quick as we get close to wrapping up? 1 John 5, verse 13. John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. See, and what's going to happen is they're going to go home after their salvation experience and they're going to discover that the sin nature is still alive and well inside of them. Right. Uh, it's been defeated, but it hasn't been disabled. And they don't have enough teaching yet to learn to live a life above and beyond the dictates of the sin nature. That's the process of discipleship, which they haven't learned yet. So the devil is going to try to tell them they're not a Christian. Right. And you have to preempt that by telling them that they are saved based on the promises of God who cannot lie. 1 John 5 verse 13 is clear. So you'll notice that in this five-finger approach, every point is educational except this... Uh, uh, ring finger so you're a sinner Romans 3.23 you're under the judgment of God Romans 6.23 Jesus died in your place Romans 5 verse 8 now here's what you're to do you're to believe in what Jesus has done for you you're to trust your eternity into the crucified and risen Christ and then if you've done that, then you have the assurance of salvation, 1 John 5, 13. Everything is educational except this finger here. Amen. And we've discovered that that method uh, keeps the focus where it needs to be Amen. and doesn't introduce uh, a works-oriented mentality right. into the presentation of the gospel. Good stuff. Well, we've done two questions. If if Christ was at the gate of heaven and he asked you, why should I, Jesus, let you into heaven? What what would you say to him? And we've answered question, that was question four. And then we've answered question five. If you were going to present the gospel to a lost sinner, tell us how you would do it. Please use exact words and try to be complete in your presentation. Include everything you think 
is necessary to be saved. And we'll, we'll do some more questions next week related to the doctrine of salvation and, and the gospel. Uh, well, we're out of time. Do we get any questions? Um, I don't think we even got any questions this time around. We must uh, have done a really good job today. Well, I... <laughs> That's what we'll say. Uh, That's well, our story will stick with yeah, us. We'll, yeah, we'll say that. Uh, God, God knows, God knows the truth. Yeah, we might have some questions coming in, but I've done an awful lot of talking, Jim. Do you have anything you wanted to add? I, I just, again, you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but, you know, I can't, First John 5.13 is, is meaningless to me in terms of the authority of the Scripture if I don't also believe that Genesis is authoritative. Mm -hmm. It comes back to that very first question, is the scripture authoritative in your life? If it is, if you understand, the whole scripture has to be authoritative. You can't pick and choose what's going to be authoritative in your life. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I know God's faithful and true and what he delivered back in Genesis gives me confidence and assurance to know when I come over here that when I share the gospel with someone, that I can tell them that once they've placed their faith and trust in Christ, they are, in fact, a child of God. Mm -hmm. It's all based upon, on what I know about the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, you know, if you were to go to a doctor and the doctor said, you're, you look good, you're healthy, your, your tests are all fine, but do you mind if I perform some kind of invasive surgery anyway? You would probably say thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> I mean, why do I need a, 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 a solution? Why do I need a cure when there's no problem? Yeah. But if, you, if the doctor came in and said, you've got two weeks to live, can I perform invasive surgery? Suddenly your answer is different. Right. You need a solution. Yeah. You, know, you basically need a cure. So if you don't have Genesis 1 through 11 down, which gives you the, the problem, there's virtually no incentive to reach out for the cure. Right. And have you noticed how Paul structures the book of Romans? You know, after giving a salutation or a greeting in the first 17 verses, it's generally believed that the, the book of Romans is probably the most theologically organized. Uh, it's like reading a legal brief of all of Paul's writings explaining the doctrine of salvation. Once you get to Romans 18... And you go all the way through Romans 3.23. He doesn't talk about the gospel at all. Mm -hmm. doesn't talk about Jesus. doesn't talk about the love of Christ. What he says is sin, sin, sin. Yeah. Chapter 1, the Gentiles are guilty. Yeah. First part of chapter 2, the religionist is guilty before God. Mm. Uh, second part of uh, chapter uh, 2, the Jews are guilty before God. You move into chapter 3, and the whole world is guilty before God. Yeah. And then finally, after this uh, intense presentation of sin, I think I said Romans 3.23, but it's really Romans 3.20 is where he talks about this doctrine of sin. Romans 1.18 through Romans 3.20. Finally, you get to verse 21, 22, 23, and following, you start getting a presentation of the gospel. Yeah. And Paul's point is you got to get a man lost before you get him saved. And that's a rough section of Scripture to get through. In fact, I noticed that when I was teaching Romans verse by verse at this church, trying to get through that section was tough. Right. I noticed our attendance started to go down because no one wants to hear about sin, 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 and our depravity and our, our problem. But until you understand your problem you have no incentive to reach out for the gospel and so there's a logical structure in the way paul teaches and that's what genesis 1 through 11 does it tells us the problem if we don't know the problem then there's no incentive to reach out for the solution so everything rises or falls according to your view of the authority of the scripture and according to your attitude towards genesis 1 through 11 well folks i'm uh, disappointed to tell you that <laughs> We were having a problem with our printer, and so I can see that you've sent in many comments and questions, and I, every time I press on uh, these to get these comments and questions, it brings up the whole screen and a large, large noise. So I can't get your questions here, and our printer can't get them for us either. 
So sadly, we're going to have to get by uh, uh, without uh, answering or interacting with your questions. Maybe we can. Maybe, yeah, maybe next time. Maybe we'll next time we can review them and go over them. So our apologies; it wasn't our uh, intention to do that, but it's the curse. Well, you know, when you step out and you, and you try to use technology for God, the devil and the yeah, demons sure. are going to throw all kinds of monkey wrenches into the into the uh, the flow. So pray for us, would you, that uh, the Lord would use this ministry, that the technology would work correctly. Generally, it does, uh, and pray that uh, you know God will use us to get His truth out through this uh, through social media and the internet and things like that. Well, with that. <coughs> in mind we are going to sign off we love everybody Amen. and we're going to see you again next week uh, as we continue to move through this questionnaire to ascertain is your church theologically sound god bless. oh before i go please uh, remember to like us metaphorically and literally <laughs> and share us on facebook and you know if you just hit like and share we, you've just multiplied the influence of That's this true. of this uh, small true. podcast that we're doing. Yeah, be sure and go get the questionnaire off, off our website also. Yeah, because I can't get this stuff to your friends. I can only get it to my friends on Facebook. But if you like it and share it, it goes to your friend base, and it goes into a whole different uh, avenue. You know, if the devil can use all this technology for his purposes, why can't we as Christians use the same technology you know, for God-honoring purposes? Yes. So with that in mind, we will sign off for next time, and we'll see you next week, same time, as we, as we deal with these important subjects. God bless you.